Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, still in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. You no doubt realize by now that great speakers and speeches will remain fully online during the fall semester. So I am preparing a video version of each lecture for the class and making all the lessons available on YouTube. Enjoy the lecture. And now we turn to Emma Goldman and her speech of self-defense at her trial in 1917. Emma Goldman was born in 1869 in Kaunas, Lithuania, which was then part of the Russian Empire, to Jewish parents. In 1875, the family moved to Konigsberg, Germany, and later to St. Petersburg. In St. Petersburg, she met and was influenced by political radicals and began to study radical politics. In 1885, when she was 16 years old, she emigrated to the United States with two of her sisters. She settled in Rochester, New York, and went to work as a seamstress in a garment factory. In 1886, this is a year after she came to the United States, was the famous Haymarket Affair in Chicago. This event was very influential in forming Emma Goldman's ideas about free speech and radical politics in America. Here's an image depicting that Haymarket Affair, which began first as a labor strike and a peaceful rally in support of something we take for granted today, which was the eight-hour day. But during the strike, in an attempt by police to break up the strike, several of the protesting workers were killed by police. The next day, in a larger protest against police violence, somebody threw a bomb, a dynamite bomb, at the police, and seven police officers were killed. And in addition, four civilians were killed. Eight alleged anarchists were arrested and tried, Seven of the eight were given the death penalty, but today most historians agree that the eight who were arrested were in fact innocent of involvement in the bombing. Emma Goldman looked on the trial and execution of the anarchists as an attempt to suppress radical political thought in America. In 1887, Emma Goldman married Jacob Kirshner but they divorced only a year later. And two years later, in 1889, she moved to New York City, where she met anarchist Alexander Berkman, whom she knew as Sasha. Berkman became one of her collaborators and companions for most of the rest of her life in America. There she also learned radical public speaking from Johann Most, an anarchist editor and speaker, with whom Emma Goldman later had a falling out. In 1890, she gave her first radical public speech, and she wrote in her autobiography about that occasion. I began to speak, she wrote. Words I had never heard myself utter before came pouring forth faster and faster. They came with passionate intensity. They painted images of the heroic men on the gallows, their glowing vision of an ideal life, rich with comfort and beauty, men and women radiant in freedom, children transformed by joy and all affection. The audience had vanished. The hall itself had disappeared. I was conscious only of my own words, of my ecstatic song. And her reference here to the heroic men on the gallows is to those anarchists who were executed in Chicago for the Haymarket Affair. Now here we have one short newspaper notice of one of her early speeches. A young woman anarchist is the headline. Emma Goldman, the Hebrew girl who wants to change the order of things. And then the story notes, Emma Goldman, the anarchist agitator from New York, addressed two meetings of working men yesterday. She is a brilliant speaker and the first few sentences won the attention of her audiences. She is about 22 years of age and of ordinary appearance, except that her hair is cut short and combed straight back from the forehead. So already at a very young age, 
Emma Goldman has already gained something of a reputation as an influential, radical public speaker in America. In 1892, she went to Pennsylvania and participated in supporting the Homestead Strike, which was a strike by American steel workers. And she was implicated in a plot to assassinate steel company manager Henry Clay Frick because the person who actually shot Frick was in fact Alexander Berkman, her collaborator and companion. And although she was investigated and interrogated, it was determined that she in fact took no part in the attempted assassination. Frick survived his shooting. But after Berkman went to prison, Emma Goldman continued to speak publicly on radical causes and she earned the name Red Emma, which stuck with her for the rest of her life, in 1893, after giving a speech to a large crowd of unemployed workers in New York. She was arrested following that speech and charged with inciting a riot. And here we see a couple of newspaper headlines about that speech. In this instance, she was tried and found guilty of inciting a riot, and was sent to prison for two years. And while she's in prison, she studies midwifery, learning to be an obstetric nurse. In 1895, she was released from jail and went to Europe under a false passport. She feared that if she went under her own name, she would not be welcome in some of the places that she wanted to visit. She went on a speaking tour throughout England and Scotland and also further studied obstetrics in Vienna, Austria. When she returned to the United States, she went on a speaking tour across America, again talking mainly about radical politics and labor rights. In 1897, she was arrested again, this time in Providence, Rhode Island, for giving a radical speech. In 1901, President William McKinley was assassinated by a man named Leon Sholgosh, who was a self-avowed anarchist and who claimed he had been influenced by Emma Goldman. Goldman was held in police detention for two weeks following the assassination, and though it was found she had no part in the conspiracy to kill President McKinley, she afterwards used the name E.G. Smith to continue her nursing career and to avoid public notice. In 1906, she began publishing Mother Earth, which was a periodical devoted to radical politics. And in 1907, she went as a delegate to the World Anarchist Convention in Amsterdam. And by this time now, she had also continued regular speaking and lecturing on radical topics in the United States. In 1916, she was arrested again, this time for speaking on the topic of contraception. And in 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and entered World War I. As part of that declaration, Congress established a draft. And Emma Goldman then began to speak and write against conscription. And it was for these activities that she was arrested again in 1917, on the charge of inducing persons not to register for the draft. She defended herself at the trial, and that is the speech we'll look closely at today. She was found guilty and sentenced to two years in prison. And in 1919, she was released from prison and deported to Russia. Though she was an American citizen, she had been born in what was then the Russian Empire in Lithuania, so she was deported to Russia, which was now under the political control of the communists following the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And here are some headlines about Emma Goldman's anti-conscription activity, her arrest, her bail, her trial, and her deportation. After spending about two years in Russia, she left and moved to Latvia and later lived in Germany, Sweden, France, England, and Canada. She became disillusioned with the Bolshevik Revolution 
1923 published those sentiments in a book entitled My Disillusionment in Russia. In 1931, she wrote her autobiography, and in 1936 came out in support of the anarcho-syndicalists in the Spanish Civil War. Emma Goldman died in 1940 on the 14th of May in Toronto after suffering a stroke. She was 70 years old. So let's take a look at the trial of Emma Goldman in 1917, the trial for inducing others to avoid or not register for the draft. We could ask what is the genre of the speech and then what is the exigence, audience, and constraints. When we understand that this is a courtroom speech and a speech of defense by the defendant herself, we recognize then that it is clearly a forensic speech. And that helps us also to define the exigence, because the exigence obviously is that Emma Goldman wants to remain out of jail. She wants to defend her innocence and retain her liberty. But I think we can also see that there's a wider exigence, the necessity from her perspective of sharing that radical message and of pointing out the hypocrisy of American government authorities suppressing free speech then who is her rhetorical audience? The immediate rhetorical audience is obviously the members of the jury, the ones who will decide whether she is guilty or innocent of the crime for which she has been charged. But also because we know that she published the speech both in her Mother Earth periodical and in a pamphlet edition later that she wanted to reach a much wider audience with the political message that is embedded within the forensic speech that she gave in the courtroom. And then what are the constraints here? Obviously, there are significant ideological constraints. Emma Goldman is expressing a radical political ideology. She is expressing a view which is outside the mainstream of almost everybody in America in 1917. So she has to look for some ways that she can cross over that ideological divide. She also has some constraints about the fact that she is herself foreign born. She's looked at with great suspicion. She's well known as a radical agitator. And so all of these work against her in her trial. So here are some of the critical questions we can ask about Emma Goldman's speech. Do you think it was possible for Emma Goldman to receive a fair trial in the political environment in which the trial was undertaken? And then how does Goldman aim to overcome the political and ideological prejudice against her? Which forensic points of stasis does Goldman address? And how do these issues shape the speech? And by forensic stasis, we mean if we think about the legal points of issue or the points of dispute that could occur in a trial, which one seems to be the focus of the argument made by Emma Goldman? We talked a little bit about this in connection with the Susan B. Anthony speech as well. And then what is the basic organizational structure of the speech? How does that arrangement help her argument? Finally, we can ask, what is the role of sarcasm in the address? And do you think sarcasm is a helpful strategy for someone who's potentially facing prison? And for what purposes does she employ sarcasm, especially in the opening paragraphs of the speech? And then what do you think of the dramatic metaphor that she uses describing all of the events surrounding her activity, her arrest, her indictment and her trial, describing all of that as a three-act play on the part of the government. So before we look at the text of the speech itself, let's take a look at this article by Catherine Palmer and Stephen Lucas, which looks closely at the two extant texts of the Emma Goldman address to the jury. The title of the article is On Trial, conflicting versions of Emma Goldman's address to the jury. 
And as these authors point out, although Goldman's speech failed to convince the jury of her innocence, that has not diminished the regard in which it is held. Goldman's eloquence was not a product of mere oratorical flourishes, but of heartfelt conviction. They go on to say that it is defined as a stirring defense of justice and the most moving performance of her life. Finally, they note that in a survey of 137 experts of public address, it was ranked among the top 100 speeches of the 20th century. So these authors begin by establishing the significance of the Emma Goldman address. And by the way, when they talk about the 137 experts of public address who participated in ranking those best speeches of the 20th century, I was privileged to be among those 137 experts. And you can find the full ranking of the top 100 speeches of the 20th century on the website American Rhetoric. So the authors of this essay go on to point out that there are actually two different versions of the Goldman speech to the jury, the one that appeared in Mother Earth and the one that appeared in the pamphlet edition, which came out shortly after. Both of them are the work of Emma Goldman, but they have significant differences. And indeed, in this essay, at the end, as an appendix, they include the text of both versions so you can look at them and compare them. The one that we'll be focused on will be the pamphlet edition. But these authors point out, as we shall argue in this essay, however, the two versions of Goldman's address are best seen not as slightly modified representations of the same speech, but as different, albeit consanguineous, rhetorical acts with their own audiences and purposes. The Mother Earth version is as close as we can get to the speech as delivered in the courtroom. Through it, we can see Goldman's efforts to reach the jury, notwithstanding her pessimism about the probable outcome of its deliberations. The pamphlet, on the other hand, is intended to present Goldman's case in the most favorable light for an audience beyond the courtroom. The authors note that there were some revisions between the first and second version, and they say that such changes were not unusual for Goldman, who typically recast her speeches for publication. So the explanation that these authors offer about the two different versions of the Goldman speech is that each is designed to reach a different audience, the jury in the courtroom on the one hand, and the wider public who might read the speech in the pamphlet version on the other hand. And as they read through the two versions of the speech, they point out some of the significant differences. They note, for example, that in the pamphlet, Goldman had eliminated some details that she had included in the courtroom speech. Why then did she eliminate virtually all the details of that description? One explanation might be that she wanted at this stage of the pamphlet to focus more sharply on impugning the prosecution's evidence. By doing so, she was able to include a number of details not mentioned in the corresponding section of Mother Earth. They also note that by taking up both parts of the charge explicitly at the outset, rather than delaying consideration of the second charge as she did in Mother Earth, Goldman presents a stronger case for her innocence. So as the essay goes on, the authors continue to offer an explanation or give an account for why Goldman may have included certain revisions from the original speech in the courtroom to the pamphlet version. In one section they say, these new paragraphs illustrate the extent to which Goldman reworked the Mother Earth version of her speech when producing the pamphlet. Once again, we see her going on the offensive not only do the new paragraphs provide additional evidence on her behalf, but they amplify her accusation that the prosecution doctored evidence, gave out false statements to the press, and presented perjured testimony in an effort to secure a guilty verdict on spurious charges. These changes are of a piece with other revisions in the pamphlet 
and are strategically placed to strengthen Goldman's claim of innocence and her persona as a victim of persecution by the government and the ruling class. So after they've gone through a complete analysis and comparison of the two versions, they conclude their essay by saying, as we can see, the differences between the two versions of Goldman's address to the jury are far more than cosmetic. While some scholars have recognized that the pamphlet is a more felicitous document than the text in Mother Earth, it is more than this. Whether major or microscopic, dramatic or subtle, Goldman's revisions in the pamphlet produced a more focused and decisive piece of writing that reflected important shifts in her audience and persona, placed a greater emphasis on her condemnation of the government, and presented a more compelling statement of her anarchist beliefs. Reading the texts against each other allows us to see the extensive differences between them and to appreciate the care with which Goldman recrafted the Mother Earth version for publication as a pamphlet. So now it's our turn to look closely at the text. And as I said, we'll look at the pamphlet edition. But if you want to see what the other version of the speech looked like, consult the last few pages of the Palmer and Lucas article. So we asked in one of our critical questions, what is the role of sarcasm and does it help Emma Goldman to introduce sarcasm near the beginning of her speech. Here's one of the passages where that is evident. The methods employed by Marshall McCarthy and his hosts of heroic warriors were sensational enough to satisfy the famous circus men Barnum and Bailey. A dozen or more heroes dashing up two flights of stairs prepared to stake their lives for their country only to discover the two dangerous disturbers and troublemakers, Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman, in their separate offices, quietly at work at their desks, wielding not a sword, nor a gun, or a bomb, but merely their pens. Verily, it required courage to catch such big fish. And then we see also the introduction of this drama metaphor where she refers to the three-act comedy. The stage having been appropriately set for the three-act comedy and the first act successfully played by carrying off the villains in a madly dashing automobile which broke every traffic regulation and barely escaped crushing everyone in its way, the second act proved even more ludicrous. $50,000 bail was demanded, and real estate refused when offered by a man whose property is rated at $300,000, and that after the district attorney had considered and in fact promised to accept the property for one of the defendants, Alexander Berkman, thus breaking every right guaranteed even to the most heinous criminal. And then we can focus on the question of forensic stasis. What is the issue that's being disputed? There are obviously factual issues and questions of definition at work in the speech. But if we look closely at the speech, we can see that Emma Goldman's argument is mainly focused on the fact that the prosecution has failed to prove that she or Alexander Berkman, her longtime companion who was now out of prison, for his attempted assassination of the steel company manager, Henry Clay Frick, that neither of them had actually done anything that met the definition of conspiracy or inducement of others not to register for the draft. She says, Gentlemen of the jury, my comrade and co-defendant, having carefully and thoroughly gone into the evidence presented by the prosecution, and having demonstrated its entire failure to prove the charge of conspiracy or any overt acts to carry out that conspiracy, I shall not impose upon your patience by going over the same ground, except to emphasize a few points. To charge people with having conspired to do something which they have been engaged in doing most of their lives, namely their campaign against war, militarism and conscription as contrary to the best interests of humanity is an insult 
to human intelligence. Now, Goldman's point here is that they had not done anything specifically charged in the indictment, that she never made an argument or an appeal to anybody to not register for the draft. But she's saying instead, or implying instead, that she and Berkman are being tried and arrested because they have taken anarchist views, unpopular political positions, and that that ultimately is the source of the legal proceedings against them. Because on this question, she's acknowledging the basic facts. She has been involved her whole life in campaigning against war, militarism, and conscription. So that is not at issue. That's not what's being disputed. On the essential forensic issue of the trial, though, the prosecution has failed to introduce sufficient evidence to show that she or Berkman ever induced anyone not to register for the draft. And before we move on here, I'll introduce this document, which is my own grandfather's World War I draft registration. He had come to America in 1911 and in 1917 registered for the draft. He was 29 years old. Then we see in the speech that Emma Goldman tries to appeal to the jury on the basis of both their Christianity and their American patriotism. Here I think she's looking for strategies or ways that she can overcome the ideological differences between her and most members, probably all the members of the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, most of you, I take it, are believers in the teachings of Jesus. Bear in mind that he was put to death by those who considered his views as being against the law. I also take it that you are proud of your Americanism. Remember that those who fought and bled for your liberties were in their time considered as being against the law, as dangerous disturbers and troublemakers. They not only preached violence, but they carried out their ideas by throwing tea into the Boston Harbor. They said that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. They wrote a dangerous document called the Declaration of Independence, a document which continues to be dangerous to this day and for the circulation of which a young man was sentenced to 90 days in prison in a New York court only the other day. They were the anarchists of their time. They were never within the law. Goldman also makes a point about the hypocrisy of an American government that suppresses free speech and peaceful assembly and freedom of the press, all in the name of making the world safe for democracy, which was the slogan adopted by President Woodrow Wilson as he led America into World War I. We say that if America has entered the war to make the world safe for democracy, she must first make democracy safe in America. How else is the world to take America seriously when democracy at home is daily being outraged, free speech suppressed, peaceable assemblies broken up by overbearing and brutal gangsters in uniform, when free press is curtailed and every independent opinion gagged, Verily, poor as we are in democracy, how can we give it to the world? We further say that a democracy conceived in the military servitude of the masses, in their economic enslavement, and nurtured in their tears and blood, is not democracy at all. It is despotism, the cumulative result of a chain of abuses, which, according to that dangerous document, the Declaration of Independence, the people have the right to overthrow. So we get here not only a charge of hypocrisy against the American government, but also a good summary of much of Emma Goldman's political ideology. And note again here, she refers once more to the Declaration of Independence, and in particular to that essential right of revolution upon which the Declaration and American independence was based. Finally, she makes an appeal directly to the jury. 
And gentlemen, in conclusion, let me tell you that my co-defendant, Mr. Berkman, was right when he said, the eyes of America are upon you. They are upon you not because of sympathy for us or agreement with anarchism. They are upon you because it must be decided sooner or later whether we are justified in telling people that we will give them democracy in Europe when we have no democracy here. Shall free speech and free assemblage, shall criticism and opinion, which even the espionage bill did not include, be destroyed? Shall it be a shadow of the past, the great historic American past? Shall it be trampled underfoot by any detective or policeman, anyone who decides upon it? Or shall free speech and free press and free assemblage continue to be the heritage of the American people. And as we said, Emma Goldman was convicted of participating in a conspiracy to induce others to refuse to register for the draft. And she spent two years in prison and was then deported to Russia. Here's some notices about her death in Toronto in 1940 when she was 70 years old, kind of summarizing her life. But notice in the story on the right here that her body was laid to rest beside the Haymarket rioters in Chicago. Though she had been deported from the United States, her family was given permission to bury her in the United States, in Illinois, and she is in fact buried in Chicago near the anarchists who were executed in 1887. So there's a review of a very interesting trial speech by Emma Goldman in 1917. If you have any thoughts on Goldman's politics or questions about or comments on her speech, please post them to the discussion board.